Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. Before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. For my coloring this week, I am doing a mostly real-time coloring on this piece of Nina Classic Crest Solar White 80-pound cardstock. I will be coloring this Simon Says Stamp and La La Crafts collaboration with Copic markers. I am going to go ahead and put this cardstock into my Misty Stamp Positioner. I am going to ink up the two ostriches with alcohol ink, or alcohol friendly ink rather. I'm using the Simon Says Stamp Intense Black ink. And then I will begin to color these super cute ostriches with my Copic markers. Um, okay, now that we've talked coloring, let's talk crime. Our 16th episode of Crime and Coloring focuses on the state of Kansas. The Territory of Kansas was an organized incorporated territory of the United States that existed from May 30th, 1854 until January 29th, 1861, when the eastern portion of the territory was admitted to the Union as the free state of Kansas. The question of whether Kansas was to be a free or slave state was, according to the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act, to be decided by popular sovereignty, that is, by the vote of the, Can the Kansas citizens. Two applications for statehood, one free and one slave, were sent to the U.S. Congress. The departure of the Southern legislatures in January of 1861 facilitated Kansas's entry as a free state later the same month. Some other interesting facts about Kansas. It is illegal to shoot rabbits from a motorboat in Kansas. In 1905, helium was discovered at the University of Kansas. Kansas is the home of Pizza Hut, White Castle, and Icy Drinks. Kansas's Dodge City is a really windy city. In fact, it is the windiest city in America. And Kansas is home to the Bender's Mounds, the homestead of America's first serial killer family. In 1870, five families of, quote, spiritualists settled in western Lebec County, about seven miles northeast of where Cherryvale would be platted a year later. One of these families was the Benders, widely believed to be German immigrants, comprised of John Bender Sr., his wife Elvira or Almira, son John Jr., and daughter Kate. The family chose from several available claims and began to make their homes. John Sr. chose a 160 section on the western slopes of the mounds that today continue to bear their name. The property was located directly on the Osage Mission Independence Trail that operated from Independence to Fort Scott. His son Jr. chose a narrow piece of land just north of his father's. However, Jr. never lived on his claim nor made any improvements to his land. After building a cabin, a barn with a corral, and digging a well on John, John Sr.'s land in the fall of 1871, Elvira Bender and her daughter Kate arrived, and the cabin was divided into two rooms by a canvas wagon cover. Elvira and Kate also planted a two-acre vegetable garden and an apple tree orchard north of the cabin. Keeping mostly to themselves, the Benders appeared simply to be struggling homesteaders who worked hard to earn their living, like the other area pioneers. The Benders used a smaller room at the rear of the cabin for the living quarters, while the front room was converted into a general store and inn. A crude sign was hung above the front door that advertised groceries to the many travelers along the Osage Trail. The little store carried a few supplies such as powder, shot, groceries, liquor, and tobacco. They also sold meals and provided a, quote, safe overnight resting place to the strangers along the road. John Sr. was around 60 years old and spoke little English. What little he did speak was reportedly so guttural that it was unintelligible. Elvira, who also allegedly spoke little English, was a 55-year-old heavyset woman. She was so unfriendly and had such sinister eyes that her neighbors began to call her a she-devil. To add to her fierce look, Ma Bender, as she was called, also claimed to be a medium who could cast a spell or a charm. 
Her husband and son were said to have feared her as she ran the household with an iron hand. John Jr. was around 25 years old and handsome with auburn hair and a mustache and spoke English fluently with a slight German accent. Junior was prone, however, to laughing aimlessly, which meant, which led many to consider him a halfwit. Their daughter, Kate, who was around 23, was cultivated and attractive and spoke English well with little accent. A self-proclaimed healer and psychic, she distributed flyers advertising her supernatural powers and her ability to cure illness. She also conducted seances and gave lectures on spiritualism, which gained her notoriety. The petite auburn-haired beauty had a desire for that notoriety, and along with her desire for fame, she also craved wealth and position. Through her beauty and social skills, she gained popularity with the locals. Her actions, though, then began to kind of put them off and cause them to say that she was satanic. Kate's popularity became a large attraction for the Benders Inn, and although the elder Benders kept to themselves, Kate and her brother, Junior, regularly attended Sunday school in nearby Harmony Grove. On May 1st in 1871, the body of a man named Jones, who had his skull crushed and his throat cut, was discovered in Drum Creek. The owner of the Drum Creek claim was suspected, but no action was taken. In February of 1872, the bodies of two men were found who had the same injuries as Jones. By 1873, reports of missing people who had passed through the area had become so common that travelers began to avoid the trail. The area was already already widely known for horse thieves and villains, and vigilance committees often arrested someone for disappearances, only for them to be later released by proper authorities. In the winter of 1872, following the funeral of his wife, George Lochner and his daughter left Independence to resettle in Iowa near his parents after borrowing or purchasing a horse and wagon from his neighbor and were never seen again. In the spring of 1873, that neighbor, who had sold George the horse and wagon, a Dr. William York, went looking for his friend, questioning homesteads along the trail. He reached Fort Scott and on March 9th began the return journey to Independence and never arrived home. Dr. York had two brothers, Colonel Ed York, living in Fort Scott, and Kansas Senator Alexander York, who lived in Independence. Both knew of their brother's travel plans, and when he failed to return home, an all-out search began for the missing doctor. Colonel York, leading the uh, company of some 50 men, questioned every traveler along the way and visited all the area homesteads. On March 28, 1873, Colonel York arrived at the Bender Inn with a Mr. Johnson explaining to the benders that his brother had gone missing and asked if they had seen him. They admitted Dr. York had stayed with them and suggested the possibility that he had run into trouble with Native Americans after leaving them. Colonel York agreed that this was possible and remained at the Bender Inn for dinner. On April 3rd, Colonel York returned to the inn with armed men after being informed that a woman had fled from the inn after being threatened with knives by Ma Bender. Elvira allegedly could not understand English, while the younger Benders denied the claim. When York repeated the claim, Ma became enraged and said the woman was a witch who had cursed her coffee and ordered the men to leave her house, revealing for the first time that she understood and spoke a little more English than she had previously let known, let be known. Before York left, Kate asked him to return alone the following Friday night and she would use her clairvoyant abilities to help him find his brother. The men with York were convinced that the Benders and a neighboring family, the Roaches, were guilty and wanted to hang them all, but York insisted that evidence must first be found. 
Around the same time, neighboring communities began to make accusations that the Osage, Osage community was responsible for the disappearances, and a meeting was arranged by the Osage Township in the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse. The meeting was attended by 75 locals, including Colonel York and both John and John Jr. After discussing the disappearances, it was agreed that a search warrant would be obtained to search every homestead between Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek. Despite Colonel York's strong suspicions that the benders were responsible or involved somehow, no one really paid attention to the Bender family after the meeting, and it was not noticed for several days that they had fled. Some days after the town meeting, a community member was driving cattle past the Bender property when he noticed that the inn was abandoned and the farm animals were unfed and dying. He reported the fact to the township trustee, but due to bad weather, it was several days before the abandonment could be investigated. Eventually, the township trustee called for volunteers and several hundred turned out to form a search party that included Dr. Bor York's brother, Colonel York. When the party arrived at the Bender Inn, they found the cabin empty of food, clothing, and personal possessions. However, there was a terribly bad odor. The odor was traced to a trap door beneath a bed that was found to be nailed shut. After prying open the door, the empty room beneath the floor, which measured about six feet deep and seven feet square, was found to have been um, covered with clotted blood. Um, the, stone floor, the stone slab floor of the cabin was then broken up with sledgehammers, but no bodies were found, and it was determined that the smell was from blood that had soaked into the soil. The men then physically lifted the cabin. I'm in awe right now. They lifted up a whole house, a small house, but a whole house, and moved it to the side so they could dig under it, but no bodies were found there either. They then began to probe the ground around the cabin with a metal rod, especially in the disturbed soil of the vegetable garden and orchard. The first body was found there later that evening, and was that of Dr. York, buried face down with his feet barely below the surface. The probing continued until midnight with another nine suspected graves marked. The following morning, the digging continued and another nine bodies were found in eight graves, plus a large number of body parts. All but one had their heads bashed in with a hammer and their throats cut, and it was reported that all had been indecently mutilated. I did not investigate that. I don't want to know what that means. The body of a young girl was found with no injury sufficient to cause death, and it was speculated that she had been strangled or buried alive. A Kansas newspaper reported that the crowd was so incensed after finding the bodies that a friend of the benders, whose name was Brockman, and was there among the onlookers, was hung from a beam in the Bender Inn until unconscious, revived interrogated as to what he knew, and then hung again. And they did this repeatedly. After the third hanging, they released him to stagger home. A total of 12 men were arrested. All 12 of them had been involved in the disposal of stolen goods, with one of them implicated in the forgery of a letter from one victim to his wife, informing her that he had arrived safely at his destination in Illinois. Word of the murders spread quickly, and more than 3,000 people, including reporters from as far away as New York and Chicago, visited the site. Dr. York's other brother, Kansas Senator Alexander York, offered a $1,000 reward for the Bender family's arrest. On May 17th, the governor of Kansas offered a $2,000 reward for the apprehension of all four family members. It was speculated that if a guest appeared to be wealthy or have anything of value, the benders would give him a seat of honor at the table, which was positioned over the trap door that led to the cellar with his back to the curtain. Kate would distract the guest while John or Junior would come from behind the curtain and strike the guest on the right side of the skull with a hammer. The victim's throats were then cut by one of the women to ensure death. The body was then dropped through the trap door. Once in the cellar, the body would be stripped 
and removed of anything valuable and later buried somewhere on the property, most often in the orchard. More than a dozen bullet holes were found in the roof and sides of the room, possibly indicating some of the victims had attempted to fight back after being hit with the hammer. For all these deaths, the Benders only gained about $4,600, two teams of horses and wagons, a pony, and a saddle. I say only because it's not very much money considering how many lives, how many people were found buried on their property. Because some of the travelers were carrying nothing of value, it also was widely speculated that the benders were killed simply just for the thrill of it. Detectives following wagon tracks discovered the bender's wagon abandoned with a starving team of horses and one lame mare just outside the city limits of Thayer, which was about 12 miles north of the inn. It was confirmed that in Thayer, the family of four bought tickets on the railroad headed for Humboldt. At some point, John Jr. and Kate got off of that train and caught a train south to Texas. From there, it was suspected that they traveled to an outlaw colony thought to be in the border region between Texas and New Mexico. They were not pursued as lawmen following outlaws into this region often never returned. One detective did claim later that he traced the pair to the border where he found that John Jr. had died of a stroke. Ma and Pa Bender stayed on the train at, did not debark at Humboldt, but instead continued north to Kansas City, where it is believed they purchased a ticket for St. Louis, Missouri. Several vigilante groups were formed to search for the Benders. Many stories say that one vigilante group caught with the Benders and, and shot them all but Kate, who they burned alive. <clears throat> Another group claimed that they had caught the Benders and lynched them before throwing their bodies into the Verdigree River. Yet another claimed to have killed the benders during a gunfight and buried their bodies on a prairie. However, no one ever claimed the $3,000 reward. And in today's money, that's almost $81,000. So it wasn't a small amount of money that people were um, offered up to try and catch this family. The story of their escape spread and the search continued on and off for the next 50, 50 years. Of the family, Pa Bender was actually found to have been a man named John Flickinger from either Germany or Holland. Now, in 1884, an elderly man matching John Sr.'s description was arrested in Montana for a murder committed near Salmon, Idaho, where the victim had been killed by a hammer blow to the head. A message requesting positive identification was sent to Jerry Cherryvale, but the suspect severed his own foot to escape leg irons and bled to death. By the time a deputy from Cherryville had arrived, identification was impossible due to decomposition. Whether John Flickinger was really John Bender is unknown. And a man who also went by the name of John Flickinger committed suicide in 1884 in Lake Michigan. So there's two possible outcomes for the presumed John Bender. Others believed that Ma and Kate murdered John because he had fled Cherryville with all the cash and valuables they had taken from their victims. So, you know, that one doesn't seem to have as much evidence, but it's still a thought. Ma Bender was discovered to have been born Almira Meek in the Adirondacks and married and was married off as a teenager to a man named George Griffith. After burying him a dozen children, including Kate, Mr. Griffith suddenly died, some said of a bad place on his head resembling a dent that might have been made with a hammer. Afterward, she reportedly married several other times, killing those husbands too, as well as three of her older children so they could not testify against her. Kate was the fifth child of Almira, who was born as Eliza Griffith. At some point, Kate married and went by the name of Sarah Eliza Davis. Allegedly, while working at the Bender Inn, she also earned her keep as a prostitute, adding an additional amount to the traveler's bills for the privilege of laying with her. In the end, it was Kate who was primarily blamed for the numerous bloody murders. John Jr. was actually found to have been a man named John Gebhardt. 
His habit of laughing aimlessly was what led him to be described as a halfwit, though many believe this was simply a ruse to disguise his clever nature. Though most were led to believe John and Kate were brother and sister, others said that they sometimes passed as man and wife. On October 31, 1889, it was reported that an Almira Monroe and Sarah Eliza Davis had been arrested in Niles, Michigan several weeks earlier for larceny. There were they were released after being found not guilty, but were immediately rearrested for the Bender murders. According to the Pittsburgh Dis Dispatch, the daughter of one of the Bender's victims had reported the pair to the authorities in October after tracking them down. Her story came from dreams about her father's murder, which she claimed to have discussed with Sarah Elizabeth. So the women's identities were later confirmed by two Osage Township witnesses from a tintype photograph. In mid-October, the deputy sheriff and Osage Township trustee who had headed the search for the Bender or of the Bender property arrived in Mich Michigan and arrested the women following their release on the larceny charges. Almira resisted, declaring that she would not be taken alive, but was in fact subdued by local deputies. Now, Sarah Eliza claimed that Almira Monroe was Elvira Bender, and that she herself was not Kate, but her sister Sarah, and she actually signed an affidavit to that effect. Meanwhile, Almira is continuing to deny the identification, and in turn, accused Sarah Eliza of being the real Kate Bender. The deputy sheriff escorted the pair back to Kansas, where seven members of a 13-member panel confirmed the identification, and committed them to trial. Another one of Almira's daughters, a woman named Mary, later provided an affidavit claiming that her mother, then known as Almira Schur, under the name of Almira Marks, was actually serving two years in the Detroit House of Corrections in 1872 for the manslaughter of her daughter-in-law, Emily Mark. So that would have been when the murders in Kansas were, be, were occurring. Records of the incarceration back up that there was, in fact, an Almira Marks serving time in prison. After her hearing, Almira denied any knowledge of Shearer or the manslaughter charge and remained incarcerated with her daughter. So originally scheduled for February of 1890, the trial was then pushed back or held over until May. Um, Almira now admitted that she had married a Mr. Shearer in 1872 and a claim she had continued to deny up until now. And, because, and she claimed that she said that because she didn't want the court to know that her name was Almira Shearer in 1872 and that she had a conviction for manslaughter. Their attorney also produced a marriage certificate indicating that Sarah Eliza had been married in Michigan in 1872. Again, supposedly moving her out of Kansas during the time when the murders were occurring. Oh, eyewitness testimony was given that Almira was Elvira Bender. The judge of the case dismissed Almira's daughter Mary's affidavit, saying that he couldn't believe anything she said, that she was basically a chip off the old block. But he found that other affidavits presented by their attorney um, supported what they were saying. And he said it was su sufficient proof that the woman could never be convicted, and he discharged them both. Um, the affidavits and other papers are now missing from the file in Lebec County. So no other further examination has even been possible. Just a note here, the judge didn't say that they were innocent, just that there was enough reasonable doubt that they were not convictable. A number of researchers question their acceptance of the affidavit's authenticity and suggest that the county was just unwilling to accept the expense of boarding the two women for an extended period of time. Also at this time, women were not often sentenced to death. People didn't like putting women to death even when they were criminals. It was kind of assumed that they were not um, intelligent enough to commit crime on purpose, but that they were mentally unfit. 
yeah, nothing to say about that. <laughs> While the two women were certainly criminals and liars, as their own defense attorney admitted, the charges were weak and many people doubted their identification as the benders. Okay, so it's a weird story. doesn't have a great ending. In fact, it has kind of a non-ending ending. Um, I do have a quick rundown of some of the victims, not counting the possible murdered husbands of Almira. So starting in May of 1871, we have Mr. Jones, who was found in Drum Creek, um, two identified men in 1872. We also have Ben Brown in 1872, who went missing with $2,600 found buried in the apple orchard. We have a Mr. McCrotty with $38 and a wagon with a team of horses who went missing in 72. Henry McKenzie with $36 and a matched team of horses went missing in 72. John Boyle, who had $10, a pacing mare, and an $850 saddle went missing in 1872, and he was found in the well. In 1872, George and his daughter, um, who had the ones that had borrowed or purchased a horse and wagon from his neighbor went missing. Later, hit their neighbor, Dr. York, who went looking for them, was also found missing. Dr. York was in, in possession of $1,900, um, and they were all fired, found buried together in the apple orchard. 1872, John Geary was, buried, was found buried in the apple orchard. Orchard. In 1872, Red Smith went missing, also found buried in the apple orchard. In December 1872, Abigail Roberts also found buried in the apple orchard. Um, in 72, they found various body parts. The parts did not belong to any of the other victims found and are believed to belong to at least three additional victims. And in 72, again, during the search, the bodies of four unidentified males were found in, drum, in the Drum Creek surroundings. And lastly, in May of 1873, Dr. William York, in possession of $2,000, went missing and was found buried in the apple orchard. And that is the somewhat disturbing, intensely disturbing, story of America's first serial killer family, or whatever you want to call them, because were they actually even really related? I do have pictures. This is a picture of the four benders, whatever the relations were. This is a sketch of their homestead or what it may have looked like. And just in case you weren't weirded out enough, there is a historical marker at the place of their former homestead in Kansas. So yeah, do with that what you will. <laughs> Thank you so much for stopping by my channel today. I have added a couple of other videos here I think you would like, as well as a subscribe button. If you have not done so already, I would love it if you subscribe to my channel. Um, leave me a comment, give me a thumbs up, and have a really great day.